the 16th century is drawing to an end as a small European nation wages war against a mighty empire. The empire is Spain, which has constructed an empire stretching from the Philippines to the American continent and Europe. The sun never sets in its shores, and it is unbeatable in sea or land. The tiny island state is England. It had only begun to set oar to the oceans. This battle switches the fates of England and Spain. The empire of Spain begins its steady decline, while England begins to reign the world's oceans in its stead. It had only been 17 years since Spain had vanquished the Ottoman Empire in the Battle of Lepanto. The invincible armada had turned into a paper tiger in just 17 years. How had Spain collapsed in such a short period of time? How had the tiny island of England been able to defeat Spain, the most powerful nation in the world? The phrase, the empire on which the sun never sets, was used to describe the British Empire at its peak. It was a symbol of the glory of the empire which controlled colonies and seas all over the world. But Britain was not the first to be given that name. Spain in the 16th century was the first empire in which the sun never sets. King Philip II of Spain was a patron of the Catholic Church who practiced the faith zealously and ruthlessly suppressed dissenters. England with its own church led by a queen was an eyesore to him. Philip II first proposed to Queen Elizabeth of England in an attempt to convert England back to Catholicism. However, all he got in return was a curt denial. Moreover, English pirates were a nuisance who looted from the treasure-laden ships of Spain. A huge amount of wealth coming in from the new continent was stolen by English pirates. A furious King Philip called for strong punishment. But the queen instead bestowed knighthood upon the infamous pirate, Francis Drake. Queen Elizabeth had actually been the pirate's protector. The government had been in collusion with the pirates, taking half of the looted treasures. England was a poor country back then. The English court's income would have been meager otherwise. It was even smaller than that of the city-state of Milan, a duchy under Spanish rule. Piracy was a source of income. Queen Elizabeth could not afford to lose. Queen Elizabeth continued provoking King Philip II, finally resulting in the eruption of his fury over the Netherlands. The Netherlands, which was under Spanish control, had staged a rebellion in a bid for independence.
Then, Queen Elizabeth daringly dispatched reinforcements to the Dutch army. King Philip had had enough. The time had come for him to show her the might of his invincible armada. And the King of Spain now realizes that the English are his inveterate enemies, and he decides that he must mount a great invasion using the army which he has in Flanders and his navy which is being rebuilt. So it's about putting Catholicism back into England. It's about removing a threat to his strategic interests, particularly in the Low Countries. But ultimately, it's about the, over, the conquest of Europe by a single overmighty state. In 1585, King Philip II finally decided to launch his invasion of England. The Spanish strategy was to have the Armada join forces with the Duke of Parma in the Netherlands in a joint assault on England. In 1588, when the Armada is launched, the English army is very small, it's entirely amateur, so the English army is useless for defensive purposes. The Spanish army is the biggest and the best army in the world. It's battle-hardened, it has many thousands of troops, very experienced, it has all the great generals, and it wins all the great battles. If it had been possible for a major part of the big Spanish field army, uh, which was campaigning in the Low Countries against the Dutch rebels to meet face to face with English forces. Most people on both sides took it for granted uh, that the English would be instantly defeated. After the Armada had defeated the English Navy, the Duke of Parma's men would land on shore via the Thames. Queen Elizabeth, who did not have a credible army, would be doomed. She, too, knew that once the Spanish soldiers set foot on England, it would be the end for her and her country. Everything depended on the English Navy. It was at this moment when Sir Francis Drake suggested a preemptive strike. His target was Cadiz, the supply base for the Spanish troops. On April 29, 1587, Sir Francis Drake launched a surprise attack on the port of Cadiz. In just 36 hours, Spain had lost 37 ships along with several tons of food and supplies. And just like a pirate, he looted all of their supplies and left the scene. The Spaniards hated and feared Francis Drake. They called him El Drake, or the Dragon, a name that shows both awe and hatred. Sir Francis Drake is the greatest of all the Elizabethan seafarers. He is the second man to circumnavigate the world. He's a great privateer. He raids the Spanish for profit, but he's also a great strategist and a great fighting sailor. He would see a tactical opportunity and swoop in like a dragon, and that's why the Spanish called him El Drac. His name did mean dragon in English. 
the Spanish fleet could not chase after Drake. He sailed away at a speed the Spanish ships could not dream of attaining. The English were better at maneuvering their ships very quickly. They could turn to bring the broadside, where most of their cannon pointed, across an enemy ship very quickly before the enemy knew what, what was happening. And that was not an easy feat because they had to control the wind, their sails, adjust the sails with ropes and pulleys and things to turn quickly, attack, and turn back again to maneuver their vessels. I believe that what they were looking for was a ship which would combine the power of the sailing rig uh, with the powerful head-firing armament of a galley. And the galleon is effectively a sailing ship hull with a galley's bow stuck on it with very heavy guns firing for it. And I think this is what the English Navy was building in the 1570s. The history of the new battleship which beat the Spanish Armada can be traced back to Port San Juan de Ulua in the Caribbean Sea. English ships began entering the port in 1568. The owner of the fleet, led by John Hawkins and Francis Drake, was, in fact, the Queen. They captured slaves in Africa to sell in America and got gold from the new continent in return. Of course, this was illegal in the eyes of Spain. The gold was supposed to be theirs. As usual, Hawkins wanted to sell the slaves and get his gold. However, things were different this time. A powerful Spanish fleet was waiting for him. The Spanish Navy granted safe entry at first, but it turned out to be a trap when Hawkins' fleet entered the port. A furious attack ensued. Two hundred men were killed or were taken prisoner. Hawkins' beloved nephew was among those captured. Just one ship was spared, but it had to cross the Atlantic Ocean without any supplies. All they had on the ship was hellish hunger and disease. When they arrived back in Plymouth, only 20 men remained alive. This voyage had changed the fates of Francis Drake and John Hawkins. The two men were filled with a desire for revenge. This became their common goal. However, the desire for revenge was not enough. What they needed was a more advanced ship that would bring the Spaniards to their knees. Hawkins found the answer he was looking for in the race build galleon. He implemented completely new engineering techniques in the ship. He lowered the deck and made the body streamlined to create the fastest and safest ship in the world. One of the sources refers to these galleons as race-built, um, meaning probably long and low. And all the pictures we have show the galleons as being low forward with the sort of galley style bow and relatively high aft where they were still to an extent built up in the old style. These sailing ships could easily cross the Atlantic, they could go long distances, they were fast and manoeuvrable and they had a very powerful armament of heavy guns. The race built galleon is the the ultimate English warship of this period. It's a ship which has the the fine lines of a Mediterranean galley um, and it's relatively low superstructure so it's it's not troubled by the wind 
Uh, it's designed for speed, it's designed to turn, so it's low to the water, it carries a heavy battery of guns, and it's designed for speed and maneuverability. After the first race-built galleon was built in 1570, 20 more followed. A whole new species of ships had appeared in the Atlantic Ocean, one that the Spanish fleet was no match for. Though shaken by Drake's surprise attack, King Philip put together his fleet once again, determined to have his revenge. May 28, 1588. He managed to put together a massive fleet led by the Duke of Medina, Sidonia. It was comprised of 20 large galleons, 44 carracks, 23 supply hulks, 35 light boats, four galleasses, and four galleys. On board were 8,500 naval officers and 19,000 foot soldiers. Here is one important fact to take note of. The Spanish Armada had a huge army of foot soldiers. Each ship had 350 armed foot soldiers, far more than sailors and gunners. Most of them could not even swim. On the other hand, the majority of the men on the English fleet were sailors. There were hardly any foot soldiers. Why had there been so many foot soldiers on the Spanish Armada? So the tactics that have evolved from the start of the reign of climbing on board each other's ships and fighting with pikes and swords, very rudimentary handguns, uh, and climbing to capture, cutting the rigging, trying to disable them. Prior to this time, most fighting that goes on at sea um, revolves around taking ships, be they ships owned by the state, naval ships, or merchant ships that are in effect hired by the state, putting lots of soldiers out under them, taking them out to sea, finding your opponent, and then ramming him and boarding and fighting as one would on land. This was like the fighting you see in pirate movies. Although the fighting took place on ships, it was no different from fighting on land. Thus, it was crucial to have the foot soldiers on board. This was how Spain won the Battle of Lepanto against the Ottoman Turks in 1571. This was why the Spanish Navy was so powerful, precisely because it had strong foot soldiers armed with guns and spears. In conventional military wisdom of the day, the English Navy with almost no foot soldiers was the exception. The English, for their part, had hardly any troops, and anyway, the English manned their ships with the idea that they needed the men, firstly, to sail, secondly, to load these heavy guns, and in fact, that those two things needed more men than they could fit in the ships anyway, so there was no room left to carry lots of soldiers. Some of them had a few soldiers, but there wasn't room for many. In 1588, England strengthened surveillance over its southern coast. Watchtowers and signal towers were built along the southern coast. On July 29th, flames began to burn from the signal towers. A giant fleet was seen approaching behind the thick fog. The Armada had finally arrived at the English coast. 
the Armada approached slowly in its signature crescent formation. They were sailing without rest in order to get the Duke of Parma's foot soldiers from Calais. England had to stop them from getting to Calais. On July 31st, the first battle finally began. The English ships caught up with the Spanish Armada and opened fire, hoping to gain the upper hand with their superior firepower. The lower decks containing the guns were filled with noise and fire. They fired again and again. An incredible number of cannons went flying toward the Spanish fleet. The Spanish fleet prepared to launch their hooks and board the ships to fight. However, the English ships kept their distance. Not a single foot soldier made it on board an English ship. The Spanish came on in a great arc. It was in the shape of a crescent. They kept that fleet because that was the formation they had used at the Battle of Lepanto, which had been such a victory for them. The English wouldn't play. The English did not sail into the arms of the crescent so that the Spanish fleet could close around them and destroy them. Instead, they would come up, fire all their cannon, and sail away before the Spanish could catch them. And every time the Spanish tried to go to England, the British would get there first, attack them, shower them with cannonballs, and the Spanish would have to turn away. parts of its enemies. However, they too came out of the battle with little to show for their efforts. This was the cannonball used in the Culverin cannons back then. Cannons of the 16th century could only fire metal balls. Exploding cannonballs of movies were invented in the 19th century. Thus, even if they hit, they could only make small holes. These holes were easily mended with planks that were on the ship. But actually having a weapon which might be able to sink an enemy ship 100 yards away was completely new. Um, the English hoped and the Spaniards feared that these new heavy guns would be so powerful that they would actually be able to sink ships. But nobody was very sure, uh, and nobody was quite sure how they would do it anyway. In the Armada battles, the English were learning. They actually themselves had never fought a, a battle like this at sea, but because the English had to just kept coming back and experimenting, they learned faster than the Spanish. If you have the right tool for the job and learn how to use it, you're in a much better shape than learning how to use it and finding you have the wrong tool, which is what happened to the Spanish. Not a single Spanish ship was sunk that day. This first battle was followed by several other clashes, which ensued in similar fashion. The Spanish kept trying to grapple on, while English ships kept firing from a distance. Although the English Navy had not clinched victory, it had remained undefeated by the world's most powerful navy. England appeared to be faring better overall. The secret behind England's strength was their cast iron cannons. England dominated the European cannon industry in the 16th century. It produced over 400 tons of iron cannons in a year. This was 70% of the total produced in all of Europe. England's cannon industry had not been so advanced from the start. The majority of cannons used to be made of bronze, not iron. This was because iron cannons had a fatal flaw compared to bronze cannons. In the 16th century, most serious guns were made of bronze. Uh, bronze is a very good material for cannon because even when it's 
going to explode, it doesn't break and fracture, it simply ruptures and you, you can see the gun starting to, to swell up and you know it's time to stop firing. Uh, early cast iron guns were prone to exploding and killing the gun crew. Thus, more affluent continental nations preferred to use bronze cannons. However, England could not afford to do the same. Their bronze making technology was far less advanced and it was too costly for the cash strap court of England. King Henry VIII, father of Queen Elizabeth I, decided to focus on the iron cannons instead. Despite its flaws, iron had the huge advantage of being cost efficient. An iron cannon could be made for just one quarter of the cost. He employed French cannon makers and English ironsmiths who succeeded in creating high quality cast iron cannons. The only country in the world that is making reliable, effective cast iron guns in 1588 is England. This again is an investment that Henry VIII made uh, over 40 years earlier. He invested in this technology. At the same time, we have a, a relatively open atmosphere in terms of scientific investigation beginning in this country. And improvements of gunpowder are coming through to the fore. So we have stronger guns combined with better gunpowder. And that is going to give you a very much more effective battle fleet. Such innovation, which transformed weakness into strength, was how England obtained a navy with the greatest mobility and firepower in Europe. In the words of Toynbee, it was a case of a brave challenge combined with a successful response. However, this leaves one question. What was Spain doing while England was making such technological strides? Why hadn't they prepared for the new cannons? King Philip II thought that the English superiority in firepower was not a problem. The reason for that was a superiority in land troops. The Spanish army was the strongest in the world, which had defeated the French in the Battle of Pavia in 1525 and the Ottoman Turks in 1571. Although it had the largest fleet in Europe and had discovered the new continent, ships were just a means of transport. Fighting was still left to the foot soldiers. Philip II is a man who believes in things the way they have always been. Uh, his opposition to Protestantism is that he believes that the old faith is correct. He believes that the old way of fighting is correct. And he believes that the old power system in which Spain is utterly dominant is also correct. He has no interest in change. Change is bad if you're Philip II. In 1453, Constantinople fell to Sultan Mahmed II of the Ottoman Empire. The weapon that broke the impregnable fort of a thousand years was the cannon. This cannon, which was called the fire-breathing lizard, was 8.2 meters long and weighed over 19 tons. It could fire a 500 kilogram rock across a distance of 1.6 kilometers. 30 carriages, 60 bulls, and 200 men were required to transport this behemoth.
The fire-breathing lizard was the greatest factor in bringing about the fall of Constantinople. This was how the Ottomans' obsession with giant cannons began. This cannon, on display at the Istanbul Military Museum, is typical of the Ottoman era. It could fire rocks as large as these. Isn't it amazing? You could crush an entire city with these. However, when the Ottomans slipped into decline in the 18th century, Baron de Tot, a French aristocrat, remarked in his memoirs, Though it looks powerful due to its size, there's nothing to fear, as it takes so long to work again after the first shot has been fired. Europeans began to focus on making field guns, which were highly mobile and easy to reload. The trend had shifted to smaller cannons. However, the Turks remained fixated on their success in Constantinople and kept building larger and larger cannons like giant dinosaurs. Even after the superiority of field guns had become evident in the 18th century, they remained obsessed with giant cannons. The Turks were at war with Russia back then. They mounted a giant cannon capable of firing a half-ton rock on the fortress wall overlooking the Bosporus Strait. It took three days to move and half a day to mount. An officer from the British Army's auxiliary force asked, does this cannon even fire? The Turkish commander replied, yes, although it's difficult to fire, one shot is enough to destroy them. Have you seen it? No, no one has seen it before. Right before the blast, everyone ran away in fear. It took 150 kilograms of gunpowder just to fire one shot. The cannon went off with a deafening blast. The force of the single explosion broke the cannon. The half-ton rock from the cannon broke into three pieces 550 meters away. Then it disappeared into the ocean. Let's now return to the battle between the British Royal Navy and the Spanish Armada. The aim of the Armada was to land the Spanish army on the English shore. To do that, it had to keep heading north along the English Channel, towards Calais, where the Duke of Parma's troops were waiting. August 6th came along. The moment of truth was drawing near. There was only 38 kilometers left to Calais. Despite Drake's best efforts, the Armada had passed through the English Channel without losing a single ship. The Duke of Medina, Sidonia, thought that once the ships landed in Calais, they could set forth immediately with Parma's 30,000 men. He had already sent a messenger to the Duke eight days earlier when he was approaching the English Channel. Once the Armada joined forces with land troops in Calais, the invasion of England could begin as planned. The fleet approached the shore. but the beach was completely empty. Instead of the troops and ships they had been expecting, they were greeted by flocks of seagulls. The Duke of Parma had not arrived yet. 
The problem for Palmer is that he and Medina Sidonia, the admiral on the Armada, don't have communication. There's no wireless, so they're just guessing. Palmer isn't very keen on doing this. He's like most sensible generals. He doesn't want to cross the sea when it's full of heavily armed English warships. So he waits until Medina Sidonia arrives off the coast near Calais, Graveline, and says, I'm here, are you ready? And Palmer says, um, no, um, we'll start loading now. Communications at the time are very bad. So the Spanish make their way up the channel and arrive to find that their army is not going to be ready for another week. Now the Armada had to wait for the Duke of Parma to arrive. They had no choice but to wait along the cliffs of Calais, where they were completely exposed to enemy fire. However, the English Navy had no idea and was gripped by fear. They thought the Duke's men and the Armada were about to meet and head over to English shores. Meanwhile, England's cannons hadn't had any effect on the enemy yet. England needed a whole new strategy, a scheme that would break apart the Armada's resilient crescent formation. On Sunday, August 7th, Sir Francis Drake came up with a new strategy. It was none other than fire ships. The ships at the time were incredibly flammable. They were made of very light, dry wood. They had to keep them dry or they'd get waterlogged and sink. They were waterproof with a material called pitch, which is from evergreen trees. It's incredibly flammable, but it also keeps out water. They use masts, ropes, and sails to, to propel themselves. Well, the masts were made of tall trees like pine trees that burn very easily. The sails were canvas. They burned. The ropes were covered with that tar and pitch, which made them incredibly flammable. Fire was the biggest fear of a sailor at sea. England prepared a fleet of eight fire ships. They were loaded up with combustible materials such as tar. Every cannon was loaded with twice as much gunpowder. The aim was to maximize the enemy's fear by making sure that the ship would explode upon contact with fire. That night, conditions were ripe for setting off the fire ships. A strong wind was blowing from the English fleet toward the Armada. Strong currents were flowing towards the shore. The weather was perfect. The Spanish men observed a small light heading towards them. However, it was not just ordinary light. They were ships ablaze with flames. The eight fire ships charged towards the Armada at full speed, pushed by the strong winds and currents. The red-hot cannons began to explode, covering the sea with rains of cannonballs. The Spanish meet the threat. None of the fire ships does any damage, but they cut their cables and sail. That's when they lose contact with Palmer's army. The reason they sail is not just because of the fire ships, it's because the previous year, it, during the Siege of Antwerp, which is not very far away from where this battle is happening, the Dutch rebels used a fire ship which wasn't just a ship that burnt. Uh, it was designed by an Italian engineer called Giambelli, and it was an exploding fire ship. Uh, this fire ship went down the River Scheldt. It hit the bridge the Spanish had built to blockade the city, and it exploded, killing over a 1,000 men. So the Spanish were quite understandably petrified that they were about to be sent to hell uh, very quickly. The Armada split into all directions following the strong currents and wind. The English attack had successfully broken its crescent formation. 
any formation keeps you from running. If you see all the other ships in your position moving alongside of you, you feel braver. I can see them. They're ready to support us. We're ready to support them. If the English attack my ship, the rest of the fleet will save me. You keep in order. You face the enemy. You stay calm. You know what you're doing. You are fighting intelligently and cleverly. But when the formation disintegrates, it's every man for himself. You start thinking, I have to save my ship. I can't help them. He's doomed. The English have these fire ships. They're going to burn. I have to get out of here. You scatter in all directions which of course means that the people that do stay organized, which the British certainly did, pick you off one after the other, and it got better again. This was the chance he had been waiting for. Francis Drake put everything he had into this one battle. It was finally time to get his revenge for the crushing defeat in Mexico. The English Navy realized that they had been too far away in earlier battles. Their cannons had been so ineffective because of the distance. Francis Drake decided it was time for his fleet to step up. He ordered a strike from up close. Part of what's happening as the Armada comes up the English Channel and the English attacking it is that the English are slowly learning that they have to get very close to the Spanish ships in order to do any damage. Once the Spanish lose their formation, as they do at Graveline, then the English can close in, they can attack the weaker ships, they can fire much more effectively because they're much closer. And this is the point where the Spanish now lose the battle decisively. 300 meters, 200 meters, and finally 90 meters the firing distance of a musket gun. The English fleet fired all at once towards the San Martin, the Spanish flagship. They were so close, close enough to hear each other's voices, but it was still too far for the hooks to reach. As the barrage from the English cannons went on, Captain Toledo of Spain took out his hooks and shouted, Come closer, you cowards! But the Englishmen never did go closer. Instead, they retorted, Surrender now, before it's too late. The Spaniards struggled to board the English ships with hooks in hand. They fought bravely even as the situation kept deteriorating. Regardless of their bravery, they were no match for gunpowder and cannonballs. The Spanish Armada was plunged into chaos under the relentless fire. Hulls were being crushed and sails were falling. The Spanish Armada retaliated with their own cannons. However, their cannons could only fire one shot every hour, making them completely useless in gun battle. The protective layer over the hull was in tatters from repeated shelling, while the deck filled with corpses and blood. The soldiers who couldn't even swim had no choice but to wait for death. the Duke of Medina Sidonia decided to retreat to the North Sea in order to save the fleet. He had to give up the plan to transport Parma's army to England. King Philip's plan to convert England to Catholicism via invasion had ended in failure. After 1588, everybody understands that the way to fight at sea is with heavy guns and skilled sailors. So that one battle changes the way navies fight. So it's the end of sailing ship navies fighting hand to hand. It's also the end of navies powered by oars. The galley navies, fast race built galleons can deal with galleys. And it persuades, helps to persuade the English that they have a future at sea and overseas. It creates a kind of English national myth 
of the nation in arms at sea. And this is very important in psychological terms because this myth, which is only partly true, but it's very powerful, helps to guide the thinking of English leaders uh, for hundreds of years. It guides them to thinking that the national destiny, destiny is at sea, that um, they don't need and don't want a major army, but investment in ships uh, is what will preserve English freedom, uh, religious and political freedom, and uh, lead eventually to national prosperity. From 1571 to 1588, just 17 years had passed since the Battle of Lepanto, the height of the Spanish fleet's glory. It all ended in the crushing defeat at the Battle of Calais. In just 17 years, the Armada had become obsolete, only they had not known it. As if to mock the human tendency to seek comfort in the familiar, the speed of innovation always takes us by surprise. With the defeat of the Armada, a new age had begun. The era of Mediterranean naval battle had ended, making way for modern close-range artillery battles. The Mediterranean naval battle was not the only thing the Battle of Calais erased. With it had gone the luster of the Spanish Empire. England, which changed naval warfare forever in the Battle of Calais, began to rule supreme in the oceans of the world. It was time for the sun to rise on the great British Empire. <laughs> 